different angles, and we'll, we will hit some here pretty soon that are going to show a whole lot of different um, <coughs> things that the cross accomplished. But there are things that it accomplished that are, uh, and, and we'll discover that more, but there are things that the, the cross accomplished that are not just dealing with negatives, which, you know, one of our first classes we dealt with that. Not just dealing with negatives, not just dealing with the, with the problems. Houston. <clears throat> but dealing with um, the things of the, of the Lord's heart, to deal uh, with the things of the Lord's heart. And while I was musing, because I wasn't particularly searching, but the Holy Spirit, he, he'll use any excuse. <laughs> you mused, so I'm going to share with you. <laughs> he started sharing with me something in relationship <clears throat> uh, in an area where we may not, we may not see the cross, uh, with just a glance, but it's an area that he just, like that, just started taking me through real quick. <clears throat> and it had to do with the tabernacle, and it has to do with the, um, the Holy of Holies. And most of you know that, you know, the tabernacle uh, it was in three parts. And the first part was a, was a door that entered into where the altar was. So that the first thing you actually experience is the altar. Then was the laver, which was full of water, and it represented the washing of the water of the word, because the high priest or the priests from then on would have to remove spots and blemishes, which usually came with offering blood sacrifices. Then they would go through another veil, and in there was three items. One was the another altar, an altar of incense, <coughs> straight, straight ahead, right in front of the veil that led to the Holy of Holies. And then to the left was the seven branch candlestick, and to the right was the table of showbread. All of these representative of Christ, but they but the thing that always got me about that tabernacle and, and how all these things represent Christ was that there was a veil right before them in the holy place so uh, in front of the, the altar of incense that you could not enter in. You could not go back there. Only the high priest could do that once a year. And that... Um, that what was behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant, but the Lord's presence literally was over that Ark. Okay, so everything is a representative of the Lord, but the Lord's in there, the real Lord, not a representative, but actually God in that cloud uh, by day and that fire by night to lead them through the wilderness. And, um, and yet the the priest, the high priest only could go in there once a year to make atonement for sin. And I kind of got on this by thinking about the word once. And I really, I was in the book of Hebrews actually, and I will tell you that the word once is a really interesting word in the book of Hebrews. Really a good word. <clears throat> Anyway, so uh, I'd like for us to, to look in Leviticus 16, <clears throat> and we'll see a little bit here. And there was this, there was this problem, the, and that was that only the high priest could go in there, and if anybody else went in there, they died, okay? Because it was holy, and the word holy means separated unto God. So... Looking at verse uh, 32, starting with verse 32. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, 
And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did, and he did as the Lord commanded Moses. <clears throat> and I've shared this before, so I'm going to quit talking while I make a little noise here. The word atonement um, the word atonement can also be understood as at one meaning being brought into oneness. And of course, the sacrifices, whether they be sin offerings or uh, sweet savor offerings, in other words, offerings for what's wrong or offerings that just blessed God that we give to him. The whole purpose of that, and you notice that this, all, this went all the way through, this went all the way through, um, that he wanted to bring an one at one moment with him. And you get that when you consider that Jesus is, high priestly prayer in uh, John 17, um, it's like a high priest about to go behind the veil through death, okay? <clears throat> and what does he pray? He's, his whole prayer is that we may be one as he and the Father are one. And that is a greater thing than just saving us from our sin. He wants us one with him as he and the Father have been eternally one together, okay? And, and, of course, we, I always emphasize that it's about the one, which is Jesus, not us, but we're brought into that. We're brought into that, okay? And so when you hear me or anyone around here pretty much talk about oneness, it's really wrapped up in this atonement, but most people only talk about the atonement in relationship to forgiveness of sins, okay? And one of the things we're going to discover and I believe in joy in this class, is that this is not just about fixing what we broke. This is going to be about something that was in the heart of God before sin and why he made the world. And much of it, well, I'll just go ahead and say all of it really representative of the tree of life, the tree of life that they never ate of. They never ate of that fruit. So, um, so here we have <clears throat> the beginnings of a, a, a thing that God set up in the wilderness before they enter in because he wants the word in us before we enter in because you can't enter in without this becoming life in us. And there's so much to this and it's really, really gloriously displayed in the book of Esther, but <clears throat> that's for another day. Yeah. Another day. Um, so, and, and notice that here it says that all of these atonements, because it's like atonement for, and atonement for, and atonement for, and uh, it just says, and for the altar, but it means an atonement for the altar. It's like the cross itself needs to be brought into the oneness that is the Lord. In other words, the great reality of the two pieces of wood is the lamb that hung on it, not the two pieces of wood. I don't usually ask for an amen, but can I get amen? <laughs> what is more important in the cross? Is it the two pieces of wood or is it the lamb himself giving himself in the way that he does? So, so when we talk about one, oneness and one, we're talking about the one who is going to be given for the atonement. Amen? That's, that's key to understanding the atonement and understanding where we're going to be going in the scriptures here. So, um, 
and then in, in several other places, um, uh, it makes plain that the high priest alone can go in there once a year. The high priest alone goes in there. And if anybody else tries to go in there, they're going to die, right? Because they're not, I don't know. I don't, I don't like using the word fit, but the word fit doesn't mean what we apply it to. Well, I'm not, well, I'm just not fit to do that. It's, it's that there are certain qualities that only he had. And we will, we'll get into some of those qualities in, in some coming classes that, because they're all important to um, the true work of the cross. And they all help us if we, will, if we will apply our heart, not our head, if we will apply our heart, those different qualities will relieve us of our fears because they pertain to garments or coverings for us. Okay. Um, so uh, turn with me now to Hebrews chapter 9. <coughs> Hebrews 9, and we'll look at, well, we'll just look at verse 12 right now. <coughs> and Hebrews 9 is talking about Jesus. And it's talking about him um, entering in to the Holy of Holies. And it says this, Hebrews 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. All right. So, um, usually our minds are stuck on, it's not about blood of goats and, and calves. Um, and then the other thing is, is that he went, we, he went in there and did this work for us. But again, what we think of is that he did atonement for us instead of at one bringing us into oneness. We're always thinking we, we have a sin consciousness. We have that from the fall of Adam and Eve. It is deep within us, and the only way to get rid of it is to start eating of the tree of life. <laughs> and, that, you know, because the other one is just the knowledge of good and evil, and then we're, that's what the law is. The law points out what's evil and points out what's good and says, don't do that and do this. Thou shalt not, thou shalt. And so basically our lives are controlled by the fruit that, that Adam ate, and we think it's of God to be able to spot evil and point it out and shame it. <laughs> and it's not. That's, uh, that's the wrong tree, as usual. But the other tree is the tree of life, and it is his life, and it is the one, it is the one that at one moment uh, is trying to accomplish but how, what good is, I mean, what is, what good is the word oneness or what good is the word at one meant if we don't know the one? And I mean know the one beyond just dying for our sins, but who he was before there was ever sin. And who he'll be after sin is all done away and eternity starts rolling. Who is he? What is our relationship to him other than sin consciousness? I mean, we're going to be throughout the eternal ages to come, uh, you know, continually going before the Lord and saying, I'm sorry. Or is there going to be a greater relationship than that? So this, this verse is, is highlighting something beyond those two things I pointed out that are the main things we grasp. And here's what it's highlighting. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. Okay. So this is um, uh, uh, something that has eternal value, not just something that happened in time. You, you see that? So when I see stuff like that, I immediately go, okay, 
I have no clue what that is. That's beyond time. That's beyond my mind and how I could imagine or think. So Holy Spirit, open Jesus unto me so that I might see the eternal aspect of his nature in what he's doing instead of just trying to save a wretch like me. <laughs> you know. But to have something, he would like to have something more than a bunch of saved wretches. So, Hebrews uh, 4 now, if you'll turn there with me. Hebrews 4, uh, starting with verse 14. <clears throat> Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so there's a lot in this, actually. Um, but the way that we read this is, um, we got lots of problems, but he went through a lot of problems so he can help us, okay? Which really has nothing to do with eternal redemption, if that's our only mentality of that, if that's our only mentality of that. And um, so I would say, and I have shared on this before, and it's somewhere <laughs> to be found, I've shared extensively on this and showed throughout uh, the book of Hebrews, that he's not just talking about all of our problems and stuff. He's talking about what he has accomplished uh, through the cross that has changed us, that has placed us in his son, that has, that has done away with you know, our sins and done all these things that we shouldn't have to um, come you know, before him worrying about but rather we should be holding fast our profession of faith that is not a faith that we're just saved, but the faith of him, the faith in him, the faith that is uh, secure in him. Because in, in the greatest truth, we are not separate from him. Yes, he's God and we're not, but we're his body. We're not God. But we are his body, and he has made us one with him, and he knows us. The Father knows us in Christ. Paul wanted to be known in him. He wanted his identity in him. And if this, this verse is only about what's wrong with us, then it's, it's declaring that we are separate, and it's declaring that our whole focus is on what we've done wrong. And that's the short, very short verse. It's the two-sentence version of whatever that, that sharing I did on, on these particular verses. <clears throat> I think, again, we miss something, something drastic in this, these verses. I think we miss something earth-shattering in these verses. I think we just see our little needs and we see Jesus, you know, there and come help me through this, and we miss an incredibly earth-shaking reality that is stated in just a few words here. And it is, come boldly behind the veil. All right. I got news for you. There's this thing about dying if you're not coming in on oneness because there's only one who can come in there, the high priest. And we need to, we need to know, we need to think this through and, and let the Spirit of God begin to open the scriptures to us that shake us out of my carnal Christian life separate from God down here, oh me and oh help me and oh this or that, instead begin to find our identity in Him. And if we do, then there is, um, there is, I don't know, let's see, I think I, 
I might have another scripture here. Well, I'll wait on that. Um, if we do, there is a um, another mind that takes over. I am not a just a messed up Christian on an earth. I am literally grafted into him and his life is literally in me. Okay, so as just people, as just a, just, just a person on the earth, I'm just a person on the earth, but I got Jesus in me. The way that translates to most Christians is, well, he's in there somewhere and I'm sure he'll show up or give me guidance if I need him or something like that. But it's not, um, uh, I am a branch. It's like I'm a person with Jesus in me. Well, you are, but in truth, then you would be his temple. which you are, but to be his branch is to be aware I can do nothing of myself. Mm -hmm. To be his branch is to be focused on, um, uh, I was cut out. See, th this has to be reality that overwhelms our earth Christianity. Uh, I have been cut out of my old existence in the old man, in the old nature, in the fallen vine, if you will, the, fel the false vine, because he said, I am the true vine, mm -hmm. which means there, there's a false vine. Um, <clears throat> I have been cut out of that by the cross. See, these are cross principles. Hmm, wow, that's good, praise God. The Lord's keeping me on the path as if I preach anything else. <laughs> anyway, um, that, um, that he did that, that, that the death of Christ, okay, so we, we look at that cross and we go, oh, thank you for dying for my sins and we're so broken and everything. Why can't we just go, oh, thank you for, for, for cutting me out of the old life and thank you for grafting me into you through the cross. And thank you that regardless of what I think or act or whatever, I, I'm one with you. Therefore, I'm going to get my stinking thinking renewed Amen. to the mind of Christ, to the oneness with Christ. I'm going to accept atonement. We go, I accepted that. I'm saved. No, you haven't. It involves all that takes you to oneness. <clears throat> so, you know, so don't be, don't be thinking that you got it when you're ignoring some of the major parts for which was his desire that the cross would bring about. We're, in a certain sense, can I say it like this? In a certain sense, we're just coming back to Adam and Eve in the garden, but there's, Adam wasn't one with God. He didn't have oneness with God. He didn't have the life and nature of them. He didn't have the image of Christ crucified in him. And that's why he sinned. That's why that we can't, that's why it was such an issue. And that's why the, the devil got in. And that's why the soul started being controlled by the knowledge of good and evil. And our mind began to be controlled by that. <clears throat> well, do, do you know Christians who are in the same condition? <laughs> That are, but see, it's not even in, in the garden in innocence. It's in the garden having failed and trying to, 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 to put fig leaves over you so that, you know, you can, you know, fig leaf righteousness. Well, you're covered by Christ, you know. And what did God do? I mean, he went and took skins from animals and covered them that had, had died. This is... This is who we are. This is who you are. This is the one that we're one with. But see, you cannot focus on oneness. You have to focus on the one. And so I think it would be good to stop talking about oneness as much, as much, and start focusing on the one that we're one with and, and to, to pursue that reality because the Holy Spirit stands ready to reveal that. But how much more can he reveal on the fact that Jesus died for our sins? I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's like some denominations every Sunday 
their whole big thing that happens is they have a big altar call. So people come down and get saved, you know. And I know little churches, they still do that. And everybody in there is saved. They are. They're all accepted Jesus. But they're rehearsing the same story of that all the time instead of saying, let us go on. Remember in the book of Hebrews? Let us go on from those simple things, baptisms and all this thing, the very, the very uh, first principles it's called. Let us go on from there. Well, let us go on to cross principles that has to do with what he did to make us one with him so that he would be the one, so that his life, his nature, his mind, his heart would beat in our hearts so that our we so that we wouldn't be challenged and this is what i believe that the scripture saying come boldly that you might find help in time of need i think if we come and we we get his mind and we see we see from his viewpoint and we see what he's accomplished not just in relationship to sin that we will find the help that we need and it won't be just forgiveness of sins for what we've done wrong it will be the help we need so that we're not living as if this is going to be our life forever. Eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. So, um, so when, when he's saying, come boldly behind the veil, come boldly in here, he's saying, come in here and embrace your death. All right, so now let's look at uh, Hebrews 2, and we'll start with verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor. And did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him. All right. So, okay. So, how many of you believe that the cross and the work is done? It just needs to be worked into us. That's the, that's the, that's the deal. Okay. Um. But why didn't Jesus, when he finished the work, just come down here, set it up, and say it's all done, and let's start, you know, and have no more influence, or at least set it up in such a way that we could see that all things were in subjection under his feet down here. But instead, we know it's true up there, but we don't see it. Therefore, in many cases, we're not motivated by it. We're not motivated because it's, it's still just a doctrine to us. It is a doctrine. If it doesn't motivate you, it's just a doctrine or a teaching, and it's just something that's passed through, you know. It's like diarrhea or something. Sorry. <laughs> it's just passed through, and it ain't going to be staying in there. Okay. Well, the Lord is more than diarrhea. He is worth everything. He is more than all of our little ways of dealing with him and studying him and going. Our, he wants our heart and he wants it in oneness. And he wants his mind in us so that we're not going through all this pain and agony and hurt and distrust and all the things that we go through that are so hard on us. Why don't we come boldly, see who we are one with, and go out of there rejoicing. In that, I'm just using that analogy right there to, to, to get us to um, this. You know, Jesus' last prayer wasn't, I hope you can get these people out of sin. You know, I hope that the cross will do it. Or, thank God the cross will, will finally get them out of sin. Well, it did, but we're still no closer to oneness because we're still focused on, we still are more sin conscious than Christ centric. We're still that. And if we're not sin conscious about us, we're sin conscious about somebody around us. It makes us feel better. Look how bad they are compared to me. You know, that's where a lot of those 
talk shows and Jerry Springer and I don't know, there's newer ones now, but you know, where they'd bring people on then their life was so messed up that people in droves would watch it to feel better about their own life. You know, it's like, well, at least I ain't dead. You know? <laughs> well, that's, see, Jerry Springer's not Jesus. <laughs> or whoever the talk show people are now. Um, who was it? Somebody, we were talking about this, I think, in, in Florida. And I said something. They said, wow, that's old, old school. And I said, no, I, I was no school. <laughs> anyway, so come boldly, but you're going to come into a place where there's death, okay? A death must happen. If you go in there, a death has to happen. All right, so we're reading here in Hebrews uh, uh, 2. Um, for in that, this is the middle of verse 8, I guess. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Okay, so he's about to explain why he didn't just manifest it all down here in that relationship. Um, wouldn't, let's think like a, a good Christian, wouldn't it have been better had Jesus died, come back, said, you people messed up and we're going to get it right now and here's the, you know, now you're going to see everything under my feet and you're all going to be happy and rejoice and, and, and earth life's going to be real good. He didn't say that. He didn't do that. He said, but now we don't even see it, not, not with our natural eyes. So what is it that he's showing us now? Well, it says right here. Uh, end of verse uh, 8, but now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Um, so, yes, it goes on to talk about crown with glory and honor, that, but it's talking about that he, what we're supposed to see of Jesus is his self-giving nature. We're supposed to see Christ crucified. We're supposed to see the Lamb of God. Not only are we supposed to see it, but this is the one we're one with. So we need to see him in his crucified form. Yes, God hath highly exalted him, and all things are under his feet. But we see not yet all that. But we can see Christ crucified, and we can see that nature, and we can see the life that he wants us to live, and, and the life that he prayed for, you know, uh, in John 17, that they may be one. So, and the last part of that verse is that he, by the grace of God, should taste of death for every man. All right. So, you all see that? Last part of verse uh, 9. There's the grace of God. Not that he saved you from your sins so that you wouldn't have to be like him. but you can continue in sin and let grace abound. But rather, that he died for all men. So as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, I forget which exact verse, 20, something like that. I don't know. No, I think it's less than that. What is it? Yeah, 15. For, um, now you threw me off. <laughs> that they that live should not live henceforth not live unto themselves but unto him who died but it goes it goes on to say that he took death for every man man that if one died for all then we are all dead it doesn't say if one died for all we're all saved first corinthians 15 uh, um see now i'm on 515 right all right, so grace to help. That's what the last part of that verse, grace to help. And that's what um, the verse that was talking about, come boldly, grace to help bring about death for every man. <laughs> 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 
So that we, would, we can say, I, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yes. You know what? It's 2 Corinthians 5, I think, 15, or along about there. All right. You want to read it for us? Okay, so it's real simple. It really is. It's a simple couple of verses there. The simplicity of it is this. One died for all so that we'd all be dead, so that we would henceforth not live unto ourselves the life that died, but unto him that rose who, who died. Does that make sense? I mean, that's as simple as you can get with that verse that one died for all, so all would be dead, okay? So we all went into death. I am crucified with Christ, okay? We all went into death so that there would be a death, um, that so all died so that, uh, and then he says, so henceforth we should not live unto ourselves because that would be as if we didn't die but unto him who died and rose again. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, so we read that it says to enter in boldly and gain oneness with him behind the veil. But it also says don't go behind the veil or you'll die. <laughs> right? All right. <clears throat> so someone says, well, the veil was rent. You're still behind the veil. <laughs> You're still in death territory leading to oneness. All right. So here we go. Second Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 3 and starting with verse 8, no, 12. Second Corinthians 3, 12. <clears throat> seeing then that we have such hope we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaketh away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ okay so <clears throat> it's referring back to Moses uh, at Mount Sinai when he went up into the mountain. And Moses went up into the mountain and God was there and he, the scriptures say that he met with God face to face and he, um, um, he didn't die. And remember there's a scripture says no man hath seen God and lived. And that was a typical thing in the Old Testament. They didn't want to see God because they didn't want to die. Okay. However, <clears throat> he did die on a certain front because he came down with, we call it the Ten Commandments, but in truth, he came down with the glow of God on his face. That's what he got out of it. <laughs> See? And what the children of Israel got out of it was pieces of stone. Okay? So he's glowing. He's like, man, God's cool. <laughs> you know? So they say, put a veil over your face. Just give us the Ten Commandments. Just tell us what you want, Lord, and we'll do it. But this glow stuff is freaking us out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this glow stuff is not glow stuff. It is the absolute result of being in the presence of the Lord and God's glory rubbing off on him because he's sitting there in the presence of God eating it up because I, he was up there for how long was he up there 40 days I think God could have said more than 10 commandments in 40 days unless God's like real slow you know one <laughs> so well, they were, actually, they were down south of Israel, so they were in the south. <laughs> All 
I don't know. Some people think I'm going to hell for that. Okay, so um, so he comes down, and they're all freaked out, and they say, we need a veil. We need a veil. And that veil needs to cordon off God from us because we don't get it. Well, of course you don't. You're afraid of the glow, but he saw God's face before the glow. He didn't see a glow. He saw God's face, and it began to affect him. And so he's, they're seeing one thing, and he's seeing another. They're seeing what God wanted, but it really wasn't what God wanted, and that's, <clears throat> I hope to eventually really, really address that, because I don't know that I have fully ever really been turned loose to, to share in this little area, but it's, it's coming somewhere. <laughs> it is, and it's really, really good. It is so God. It is so showing his heart. But anyway, so, it, so, they, so, they, so what do you have? You got a veil on his face. You've got the glow being cut off. <clears throat> um, and you've got the people with dead, cold stone with, with what God wants written on it. They didn't see the heart. They didn't sense the, the realities behind it. They just, uh, and besides, they didn't look at the tables of stone and says, get rid of it. They said, get rid of the glow. Yeah. That's, what, that's what they didn't want. They didn't want God. They didn't want to see God face to face. All right, so this is saying, but not as Moses, and I'll explain that in a minute. Verse 14 again, but their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded, all right? Once you put that veil on there, they can't see, they're blind. They can't see God. They see religion. They, they see uh, that there are expectations without really seeing him. And, you know, all that does is either make you self-righteous or, or, you know, go into self-pity or something. But their minds are blinded, and that's represented by that veil. <clears throat> For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. He said the same veil. He said the same veil. Now remember, when this was written, when 2 uh, Corinthians was written, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So he's saying... The same veil is there where they can't look into the Old Testament or what they call the Bible, not the Old Testament, and see God because they've got a veil. The problem isn't, you know, Jesus said, or and Paul said it, he says the, the problem is not the commandments and this and that, you know, they're righteous and good and holy and everything. The problem is us because we're carnal sold into sin. All right. So he's saying... Um, that this veil is still there. This veil is still there where people go to the scriptures, but they want to veil over God, and they want to just get out of it what they can by their own natural senses and what they can see and grasp and what they can form according to what they, you know, their particular nature or way or thought processes. All right, verse 15, or, uh, yeah, well, actually the last of verse 14. Which veil is done away in Christ? Okay, so it doesn't give you an explanation right at this moment, but it will a few verses down on the exact process that will do away with this veil where we can see the Lord, where we can see him. All right. So, but, but we know that it's done away in Christ, whatever that means. 
All right, and then, it, as I said, a few verses, it'll explain. Verse 15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. All right, so it's not just on their eyes. It's a heart condition. It's a heart condition. Is, is God concerned about a heart condition? Yes, he is. You see it here. You see it um, when in Hebrews when he's talking about the children of Israel uh, and uh, talking about that they have unbelief. And it says they do always in their heart stray from me. And, you know, there's several things that it mentions that th that, that was actually a heart condition. <clears throat> All right. So it's still there. Um, Nevertheless, when it, and the word it there is, is the heart, it is upon their heart, last part of verse 15, nevertheless, when it, the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Okay, so here's what we say. Well, I, my heart is for the Lord now. I, I see the problem, so now my heart's going to be for the Lord. I want you, Lord. I want you, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. You're everything to me. Yes, I want you. Um, that's not your heart. That's your religious spirit again, <laughs> which probably needs to be cast out. But anyway, <laughs> just, just messing with you. But anyway, maybe, maybe. <clears throat> um, um, when the heart turns to the Lord <clears throat> is explained further down. It is not... The, it is not the explanation of my heart just needs to turn to the Lord because every man's way is right in his own eyes and every man's idea of my heart turning to the Lord is right in his own eyes. And 90 some odd percent, I'm, I'm guessing because I know everybody in this situation, <coughs> is not, it does not, uh, it, they do not, the, the veil is not rent. Yeah, that's right. Joseph just had a deep thought. I heard it. <laughs> that was the Lord for you to meditate on what I just said. <laughs> All right, so verse 17, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <clears throat> All right, well, to f see, the last couple of things, it has not given specifics as to what it means. The veil, the heart being turning to the Lord, uh, the veil taken away, um, the Lord is that spirit. It hasn't, it hasn't given us. Hello? Somebody doesn't want me to. Now, where the, now this Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <clears throat> all right, so here it is, verse 18. But we all with open face, meaning no veil, beholding as in a mirror, because that's the, the, the King James glass, but it's talking about mirror because they didn't have glass mirrors, but they had, they called them a glass, but it was a brass thing that they would shine up and the ladies could look in and see their face in there. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, several definitions here. <clears throat> um, what does it mean for the heart to turn to the Lord. It means the same thing as was said in the Old Testament. No man can go into the Holy of Holies because if you do, you shall surely die. You will die. That death takes place right here when they look into his face and they are changed and they die to their old identity and Christ is formed. See that Christ uh, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. A death takes place, but it's not physical death. 
It is an identity change and a death to who we were so that Christ may be known in us, so that Christ may be magnified in our mortal flesh, uh, like the scriptures say. So the, to do that, <clears throat> the heart has to turn to the Lord and say, I want to see your face. Okay, that sounds so spiritual. It sounds so spiritual. But to see his face, you're going to have to go behind the veil. And to go behind the veil, you're going to have to die. And if you die, you're going to lose your, the true death is that you lose your identity. And Christ is your life. And now you live by the life of another. And now it is about him and it's not about your old life. Lord, fix me. Do this for me. Lord, I have this problem. Lord, it's this and that. It is truly coming boldly to the throne of grace. <laughs> and by the grace of God, he tasted of death for you and he is bringing you into it one moment. He's bringing you into the one. And now there is change. And, you know, I, again, you know, when the heart turns to the Lord. So I hear people say, you know, I got in a good place now. I went to Christian rehab. <laughs> I got off a of religion. <laughs> and now I'm ready to, to, to be, and there is no change because there's no death. Do you understand? There, if there's not that death to ourself, there cannot be a change because the, the mechanics of how we work in there will rise again every time, all the time. We need Jesus and not just as our Savior. Robert, were you going to say something? Right. You no, know, because they were in fear of death of everything that they had seen. Right. So, you know, they, they couldn't look to their own death to see everything that that you're saying to confirm that. Amen. <clears throat> well, and for them, the end of that which is abolished was everything in the old covenant, everything of the way they related to God. All of that begins to be removed. How? By Jesus coming and saying, it's over, now everything's new? No. By Jesus coming and dying and bringing us into death with him, and by doing that, then as we approach that veil, which... Israel was kept out of and would die, we enter in, and he says enter in boldly and die to our old identity. And we begin to be changed from glory to glory. So, so it really truly is a death to their identity in the sense that, you know, like think about, think about Paul who was a Pharisee. I mean, he was could have been in line for being a high priest eventually or something. Um, he gave it all up, but he didn't give it all up. He was changed to another identity. See, one is fighting an old identity. The other one is seeking a new identity to come boldly in there for my death so that I'm changed out of what I was and into oneness with him. So, the Lord is that spirit, um, and that spirit is the one that brings us to death. It is a spirit that, it, it liberates us, because just think of, think of this. The hardest thing for a Jew, any Jew that got through the outer court and then into the inner court and then into the holy place and stood before that big veil and knowing God himself, not trinkets that represented him, God himself is there and he's not a high priest and, and somebody says, dude, you can do it, go on in there, <laughs> you know, and he's going, oh man, you know, he's fighting everything because he wants to live, he wants to live. And he's not wanting the Lord to live at that point. He's wanting to live. And so he's just like, you know, I don't know, man. No, man, let's don't do it. I just see a bunch of teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God he said no. <clears throat> but on the other hand, in the new covenant, this is the new covenant. The rest of this chapter, which Robert went to, 
is about this, this difference between the spirit and the letter that brings us up to this. And when you get to the new covenant, <clears throat> then you can enter in and there is a death and it doesn't lie. It's still the fulfillment that there's a death. It's just that you're not annihilated. You're dead with Christ and therefore you're risen with Christ and therefore Christ is your life. Bingo. Let's see. Yeah, so wasn't this a fun little journey tonight? Because you see the pattern. You see the path. You see that this was established by God long ago in the Old Testament. And this is now the fulfillment of it. And we now can enter in boldly, but not, not, in, the, not in the pretense of being uh, old creatures that are still flailing around with our life like a fish flopping on the deck, you know, that we just pulled up. And, you know, instead... We have him as our life. We're one in Christ. There is, is there anything higher than being one with him? And it's certainly not our life is not higher than that. So we're going to just have a quick prayer and I guess take a little break. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for your spirit that is upon us to shake us out of our our thinking, our ways, our identity, and bring us into fullness of life, fullness of life. And that's you. It's not us. And we want you. We want you in a real way. And we say yes to going boldly in there, knowing what it means, because we want you. So we thank you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Kelly's class is going to start here shortly. So if you need to run to the restroom or do anything, feel free to do.